one time this little, uh, well, I think one of them was Cinderella, and one of them was Belle, they had these different little dresses and slippers and stuff, and they'd be twirling in the living room. And, and they're right, midnight comes all too soon, doesn't it, Dad? Yes, it does. Okay. But uh, right behind them, now we've got a couple of real little ones will be twirling around here pretty soon. <laughs> As they get walking better and stuff, and so that'll be that's exciting as, as well. Um, well, before we uh, before we get into our message here this morning, I want to got a prayer request for you guys, and that is uh, be praying for Wayne. Wayne got hauled to the hospital by ambulance last night, and he is uh, um, they're running some tests on him and stuff for some infections, and they haven't found anything yet, but he'll be in the hospital at least through the rest of the weekend here. They said, and uh, and we'll be keeping you updated if you're on it text uh, prayer chain thing. If you're not, you'd like me, just let me know. I can add it at any time. I just, it's, uh, you got to ask for it. Um, but, uh, uh, so be praying for Wayne. And then uh, also, uh, Darlene, she said to thank the church for her um, knee surgery. Uh, went well this week. I remember we were praying for her on Thursday. And uh, that went well. And she's back home and doing well. And so, and so she said thank you for prayers for her. And they did just schedule Wayne's second knee surgery for the 20th. I don't know what he's going through right now will affect that or not. So I'll uh, be praying kind of along those lines as well. And then Tom told me today that his daughter Tara, her father-in-law, his name's Harvey, and he's got diabetes and such, and they're talking about maybe some amputation uh, in his near future here. So we'll be praying for, for Harvey as, as well as we, uh, as we think of these different people and, and the needs that they're, that they're going through. Um, uh, oh, I should give you one uh, update also on, on Mark. Uh, Mark, this last week, had another surgery. He had uh, the fluid in his brain wasn't uh, dissipating out like they had hoped, and it ended up uh, kind of forming a pocket up on his scalp and stuff. And so this week, they went back in and put a shunt in, and that shunt goes all the way. It's kind of impressive. That the shunt goes from his head down to his stomach to drain that all the way. So he is... He, Doing great. Uh, right after the, shortly after the surgery, within a couple hours, I think he called me and sounded great again. He got sent home the next day, and so he's he's doing well. But uh, just be praying. That the thing with the shunt is it opens up a pathway for infection. So if he's like to get a head cold or something like that, well, there's a or or a stomach flu, that kind of a thing. Well, then now there's a path from the stomach to his head. You know, that's easy to follow. So be praying for him that he's able to avoid infection and stuff like that. All right, let's go ahead and spend some time in prayer together. Our Father, we're thankful for this day, and we're thankful for our fathers, and we just pray that you would bless them today and, and that they would recognize or feel that how uh, important they are to us, and uh, we just thank you for their impact in our lives. Father, we also uh, pray for these people that are going through some struggles. We think of Wayne and, and another faithful man there, and we're thankful for him, and, and we just pray that you'd be with him. Uh, we know that his second knee surgery just got rescheduled, and, and hopefully that will be able to go forth because hopefully this other stuff will he'll turn out to be fine. So Lord, we just pray that as he's in the doctor's care right now, that you would help them with the tests that they're running to find that uh, whatever's causing problems and that it would be easily remedied and that uh, Wayne would be home and, uh, and healthy soon. Father, we also think of Mark and his having to have another surgery this week, and we just pray for his continued health, and, and uh, we thank you for his desire to be in the pulpit and even his ability to be in the pulpit, even while he's recovering from these surgeries, and, and so we pray that you bless him and his ministry. Uh, pray that you watch over him and Gretchen and just uh, continue to help them to feel the comfort uh, as you're with them in this. Father, we pray that as the doctors consider radiation in the future, for his uh, dealing with his brain tumor, that, that you give him wisdom to know what needs to be done there. Uh, Lord, we also pray for Harvey. And we, we think of him and, and just pray that they'd be able to get on top of the infections and stuff that's going on there, that he might not need his leg amputated, and that he'd be able to curb that diabetes and uh, enjoy a better health. We also thank you for Darlene and, and for bringing her through this knee surgery this last week. And, and uh, we just pray that you help her to, to heal and to heal quickly and, and completely. And we thank you for your work in, in her lives as well. Father, we thank you for the family. We thank you for this institution that was created by you 
and we thank you for the security that we draw from our family and the, and the stability and the, the protection and, and, and the, um, the emotional needs and the, the community needs. And, and God, there's just so many things that you do to us, uh, for us, through the family. And so, Lord, we're thankful for our families and for our fathers within those families. And we just pray that you would continue to bless the family. Lord, there's so many things in our society and a battle against the family. We just pray that, that our families would, would stay strong and uh, would overcome. And we pray uh, in areas and, and, and that where they struggle with maintaining good families, we pray for, for Christians to rise up and churches to rise up and, and to help with those uh, situations and to, to promote uh, the faithfulness of fathers within those homes. And, and uh and we just thank you for having your blessing just coming with that. And we're so grateful for it. Father, we just pray that you would bless our time here together today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, we're going to continue through our study that we're working our way through. So if you could take your Bible out and turn to Exodus chapter 20. You find yourselves right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, which is, which is where we're where we are in our study. Now, I'm thankful that it just happened to work out the way that it did. Or when I say it just happened, to, at least it wasn't planned by me. Maybe, maybe God is, is overseeing this better than I am, but I don't, uh, I don't, I don't keep an eye at hand a lot of times too far on the calendar, so I will confess to you today that the reason that we're on the study and the command to honor your father and mother is just because we're... That, we're just going through the study, and that's where it landed. Um, last week, we covered the Sabbath and uh, remembering the Sabbath. And so I just love it that it worked out this way, that we get a, that our study just landed just at the right time, just in the right place with dealing with Father's Day as well. <clears throat> and I think it's a crucial time to be dealing with Father's Day. I'm thankful for, for the fact that Father's Day landed on this week of the year. And more this year than ever before and that's because I'm convinced as I mentioned to you earlier that a lot of the unrest that we see across our society and a lot of the problems uh, occur because of fatherlessness because of the breakdown of the family as God intended it to be and so I think it's a good time to be celebrating Father's Day a good time to be promoting that idea of fatherhood <clears throat> so as we look at Exodus chapter 20 we're going to begin our reading in verse 12. It says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You know, this Father's Day, Lisa made my, my dad a really cool card, and, and i got to apologize to my dad up front because you know, I know he's watching. And um, uh, cause I, I don't know what to apologize for. Because uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the cards. I'm either blowing his secret of what the card's about, giving it away before he gets it, or the fact that I mailed the card too late because he hasn't got it yet. So for one of those things, I'm apologizing to my dad for. But uh, Lisa made my dad this really cool card. It has a picture of a globe and stuff on the front, and it has kind of different layers, and it looks really sharp. And when you open the card up, what it's about is it's, it says uh, that about, it talks about him making the world a better place. And she made the card, that's why it looks good. And then I signed and uh, wrote something, my, this is a little something like that, I love you dad, I'm Father's Day kind of thing. And then we mailed it off. And in doing that, after looking at the card that she made for him, I just, it just made me stop and think about my dad a little bit and think about that idea about you make the world a better place. And my first thought was, well, you sure made want my world better. I've recognized for a long time that the, a lot of the opportunities that laid at my door that I had an opportunity to take advantage of or the ability to take advantage of are directly related to my parents because I was raised in a, in a solid home. I was raised in a place where they taught discipline and responsibility and, and, um, and they uphold, upheld good virtues and they tried to pass them on to their children and, and a lot of the, the world that I got to experience as a young person growing up in the safety and security of that home was because my parents were faithful and because I had a good dad. 
And so I was, I'm very thankful for that. But you know what? Then I, I took it that kind of next step. And so well, well, what about the world as a whole? And I'd have to say that as my dad strived to make my world what he thought it should be for raising a, a son in and raising a daughter, as I have one sister, uh, as he strived to make our world what it should be for raising good kids, he also impacted the community in which we live. Because, you know, none of us is an island to ourselves. If you're a, if you're a, a, a delinquent parent, then that's going to impact the community that you live in. If you're a faithful parent, it's going to impact the community that you live in. No, no matter what you do, it's going to impact everybody around you for good or for evil. And you know what? I see that in my dad. Because my dad, you know, we live in a small town. I was born in Yakima, Washington, so it's kind of south central Washington. Pretty big town. I'd compare it to like Duluth, maybe a little bit bigger than Duluth. Uh, but I grew, I uh, moved to a little town called Zilla in, uh, in when I was born in the third grade. And Zilla was a small town, about 1,000, 2,000 people, maybe it was a farming community. Spent my summers as I grew up <clears throat> picking fruits and stuff like that for local farmers to earn a little bit of spending money. And so it was a nice little town to live in. One thing about smaller towns, they also don't have some of the things that larger towns have. And so when we got moved in there, my dad and a couple other men in the, in the town decided it was time to have a, a little league program for the boys. And uh, so they got that started, and they all co and they coached the teams, and they rounded up sponsors and from the local businesses, and, and they got that rolling. <clears throat> Why was my dad involved in it? So I could play. Um, then, uh, then they, they immediately got going on basketball. And they got a little uh, elementary school basketball program going. And took us, coached us, and took us traveling on the weekends to different towns that were close by and around us, and, and teach us how to play basketball and all that kind of stuff. And, and why was my dad involved in that? Again, so I could play. But everywhere he got involved so I could play, it also meant that five other kids at least got to play basketball. A bunch of kids got to play baseball. So, it impacted the whole community. And so these men, my dad and mom, started these programs, and then as I kind of worked my way up through them, and then my sister got to be that age, and they started all the girls' programs and, and uh, got those things rolling because he knew that those kind of things would have a healthy impact in my life. And so I thought, you know, he did. He does make a difference, not just in my world, but in the world, the, whole, the world around, the community that we live in. And you know what? That should be encouraging you fathers that, uh, you know, a lot of times we get focused on our families, on our kids. You're impacting a lot more than your kids. Now, your primary goal is your kid. But you're impacting a lot more than that. There's a lot more people around that are taking notice or, or being influenced by the way that you relate with your children. And that's what, as we look at it here this morning, that's what we want to do. We want to honor our father, honoring our father and our mother, but it's Father's Day, so obviously I'm going to speak uh, most clearly toward the fathers. But, because uh, mothers, we just did you a little bit a while, a while ago. But uh, uh, it's, it's not just recognizing fathers, it's recognizing that whole household, that whole traditional family structure in which the fathers as a leading role are a dynamic and important role within the family. Well, there's three different words that come to my mind as I look at this command. The first word that comes to my mind as I consider the idea of honoring my father is attitude. It's attitude. Because to honor means to show respect. It means to, to recognize value. You know, that's just kind of what we did with Gabe here a little bit ago this morning, is that as he's going off into the armed services and we honored him, we're showing him respect, we're recognizing value. Here's a, here's a valuable young man that is committed to protecting the things that we value. And to put himself at risk even to do it. Well, that's the same thing that we're doing with our fathers. We're, we're recognizing value, we're, we're having a good attitude. And you know what I think about when I think about my father and uh, and my growing up time, there were a lot of times where I did have a good attitude. I was thankful that my dad started the programs. I was thankful that my dad 
you know, took us camping and, and did things with the family. I was grateful for a lot of things that he did, but <clears throat> you know what? There's also those things that I weren't, wasn't too grateful for. There were times when I wanted to go my own way and do my own thing, and, and he would be a roadblock in that path. Today, I'm very thankful for that formidable roadblock. At the time, not so much. You know, so at the time, sometimes I'd respond to my dad with maybe the rolling the eyes kind of attitude, the roll the eyes in the head kind of thing. Not in his direction. You've got to turn before you make that mistake. <laughs> but, because uh, he too was a disciplinary. <laughs> and uh, so, but you know, you have, sometimes as a kid and as a teenager, you have that kind of an attitude toward your dad. But you know what? It's time for us to recognize that our dads uh, do what they do for a reason. And we need to recognize their value and honor them. And so young people, or old people alike, we should be responding toward, and even some, for some of us, it's just a memory. For some people, it's not about being able to call your dad after the service today or express your gratitude. For some people, it's, it's just remembering. And unfortunately, in a, broken, in a broken world that we live in, sometimes the memories aren't all that great. Well, you know what? Even that, even that, we have a loving Heavenly Father that says, I'm working all that together for your good. Even those things that hurt you, even those things that are painful, I'm working those things together for your good. And you know what? Even that pain that is within you, God will use to make you who he wants you to be. And so, even if you have that, even if the Memories that you have are few, and the memories that you have are painful. Even that is something that you can look at and say, God, I know that this is hard for me to deal with, but I also know that I wouldn't be who I am right now without that experience. And recognize that God is molding your life in that way through those things. And so, <clears throat> fatherhood, we need to have a good attitude. We need to be able to be thankful for what God has put in our life as our Father and, and for the faithfulness that our fathers bring to us, for the family relationships that we experience with them. We need to have that good attitude, an attitude of respect. Well, not only is it a matter of attitude, as we honor, as we show honor, recognition of value, um, obviously that deals with attitude, but it also deals with action. It deals with action. Now, some of the actions that are going to take place today are some of them are just thank you. Say, happy Father's Day. Thank you for your impact in my life. Some of them are phone calls. Some of them are cards. There's lots of different ways for us to expect, express gratitude toward our parents for our fathers in action. But you know what? The Bible, the Bible insists that we honor our fathers and that our actions back it up. That it's not just a matter of having a good attitude. That it's a matter of um, that it's a matter of putting uh, putting where the rubber meets the road, I guess I should say, or putting actions, putting putting actions to your attitude. You know, we see this through the Bible. With young people, it's in obedience. Right? God tells us to honor our father and mother. And what exactly does that mean? When dealing with young people, when dealing with children, the way that you honor your parents is one through that attitude, but also through obedience. You know, in Ephesians chapter 6, and verses 1 through 3, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then he quotes the command, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. And so he actually quotes from Deuteronomy. If you read uh, Exodus's account of the Ten Commandments and Deuteronomy's, they differ just a little bit. And this is where they differ. Because Deuteronomy, Moses is teaching the commands that were already given, and he adds to it uh, the promise that it says here in Ephesians. It's the first commandment that God gives, and, and in this list of Ten Commandments, this is the one commandment that God stops and gives a promise with it. And what is it? So that you'll live long in the land, and that it'll go, uh, Deuteronomy adds a phrase, so it'll go well with you. And so we'll deal with that in a few moments here. But... Children, your primary responsibility toward your parents is obedience. God has structured the family the way that it is so that you have parents that have 
a past. They have a lot of things that they've learned in their life that you need to learn. And believe it or not, as you come across these different situations, even though it's going to seem like they're crazy from time to time, they really have a better handle on what's going on than you do. Because you're inexperienced. And they really have great goals for your life. They don't, trust me, they're not just trying to keep you under their thumb. There isn't, I've, I've been a child, a teenager, a parent, and a grandparent. And trust me, no parent wants you living in their house forever. <laughs> they, they want you to do what you need to do while you're in their house now. And then when the day comes, go. Can't miss you if you don't leave. Right? Now, the point is, they want you to be not a baby comical, obviously. They're not itching for you to leave, but they're itching for you to be responsible. Yes. That's what it's about. And they're trying to bring you to that maturity and responsible way so that when it is time for you to start your own family, that you're ready. And that you can enjoy the blessings of that family as it's intended to be. And so that you don't have to learn things the hard way. That's why they set up the roadblocks. That's why, that's why they set up the fences. Whenever they set up the fence, it's probably pretty close to a cliff. And they're trying to protect you from something dangerous. And so, children, your primary responsibility with your parents is to honor them by obeying them. You might not understand all the reasons of why they got this command and why they have this rule right now. It's going to make sense to you later. I promise you, you're going to come to a time in your life where you're going to look back and say, wow, that was a pretty good idea. I'm thankful for that thing that I used to kick against. You know, when I was a, when I was a teenager, I know I've shared this with you many times, but uh, when I was a teenager, about the beginning of my senior year, I decided my life was my life and I was going to do with it what I wanted. And so I put my parents through a real test. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to do what I want, when I want to do it. In fact, I did a few things just to make sure that they knew that. And you know what? After a very short time, I got invited to live somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> By my parents. But I already knew that was coming. I was pushing into that. I already had a place lined up. It was a beautiful spot. Concrete walls, damp basement, living underneath three young, young bachelors. And by the way, that room was the laundry room. That was where I lived. Um, pretty soon, I goofed up at school, got invited to leave there for a few days. I goofed up at work, got invited to leave there too, but not just for a few days. I could come back and shop, it was at a grocery store, but I wasn't allowed to come back to work anymore. You, you know what I found? I decided I was going to go do things my way. My parents didn't have all the, all the answers, as long as I was willing to pay the price, I could do whatever I wanted. And so I started to do that. And very soon, I was kicked out of my house. Well, as they get rid of it, more my decision than theirs. I pushed them to it. But I was out of my house, I was out of my job, out of my school. Those are kind of really the only three things I really have going in my life. So there wasn't much left to screw up after that. But my point was, I decided to go my own direction too early, and I went the wrong direction, and it cost me dear. And thankfully, my parents let me come back, and I decided to do things their way and got things going in a better direction. But you know what? There's a reason our parents are in charge. It's for our good. There wasn't anything good that came out of the experience that I had, except for that it put me back where I needed to be. Children, we obey. And it's not just in children. You know, at the other end of, of uh, or later on in adulthood, we all still have a responsibility to our parents to honor them. In fact, we see this in John chapter Eight, verses 28 and 29, we see that first of all, it was the example of Jesus to be obedient to his father. He says, so Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. So sometimes, you know, as a kid, there's we always have that desire to be independent, to do things on our own, right? And that's not a bad thing. That's how we grow up. That's how we mature. But it needs to be done with supervision, with the parent, with your father. And if you start thinking, you know what, I'm too big for this. I don't need anybody telling me what to do anymore. Jesus still has somebody telling him what to do. 
his heavenly father. So you're not out, you didn't outgrow this yet. You know, yesterday I, I uh, mowed the lawn. And as you know, all my kids left me. They all moved out. <laughs> so I have to, it's like I say, most times I'm not complaining about that. But I have to mow my own lawn. But I see this other generation coming up. And so this other generation coming up, I got grandkids over visiting. And so it's time to get them on the lawnmower. And so I, I started, I could tell Leah yesterday, you know, I said, you know, if I'm teaching your kids to mow the lawn, they get to mow my lawn. So move closer, get back here. But anyway, I put uh, Malachi on the lawnmower, no blades turning or anything. Put him in second gear and let him drive around the yard. He can drive wherever he wants pretty much on that. I just kind of keep an eye from a distance. There are times I go get up and start to move a little closer when he's good, heading towards something, but he, he, he does well. He doesn't run into anything. And uh, he drove a little bit last year, so he's a little familiar with it. And then, uh, well, Justice saw that. Justice wanted to ride the lawnmower. Well, okay. But he doesn't want to ride it with Grandpa. Grandpa's got to be off. So I put it down in the first gear, and I walked alongside Justice. Uh, occasionally, I have to pull him off a tree or come off a tree. <laughs> But he still, he still got to do it on his own. And then, and then uh, Asher's out there standing at the deck, just chomping at the bit, looking forward to his turn. And so I thought, okay, I get done with Justice, I'll put Asher on. To make it more exciting, we'll go faster, get it up into maybe sixth or seventh gear, and we'll take Asher for a fast little ride with Grandpa, and then he'll be happy. Just finished up Justice's ride, and I look over to Asher, and I say, come here. And his face lights up and he starts heading my way and I start to climb on the lawnmower and he stops and he's like, instant tears and no, <laughs> by myself, right? And so I thought, oh, what am I going to do with this? So then I, I, I put it back in first gear, put Asher on the seat and I just walk along with him and I, I turn the wheel. He, he's thinking he's doing his stuff, but I turn the wheel for him here. <laughs> right? Because... Because he needs, he still needs that that supervision. There's that there's that something in us that wants to do it on ourselves. Let me handle this, but you're not ready for this, right? When we're when we're little kids, it's it's crossing the street. You're not allowed to walk in the parking lot without me holding your hand. You're not allowed to cross the street on your own. We do, we supervise them in that until we see that they're ready. Then they can do that. And then they get a little bit older and they want to mow the lawn. And now, well, let's ease, we ease them into that. And when they're ready, which hopefully soon, we get them into that where they can do that. Because that's a dangerous piece of equipment. And, and so we start working them into these different things. And, and then they get into relationships and they think they're all ready to handle it all on their own. You know what? They're just as new to that as they were to crossing the street when they were two. But now the stakes are and so we gotta walk them through that too. And yes, there's a they're gonna start the distance, but they need some supervision. And so there's there's this there's this relationship. It's not just about the rules that are in place within the home. There's this relationship that needs to be taking place to get you from dependence to independence. But that relationship is crucial. Well, then as we get older. We're out on our own, we have our own family, our relationship with our parents isn't over. It changes some. But it's not over. We still need to have a good attitude. We still need to honor our parents. We still need to be grateful and thankful, which by this time is usually very much easier. Because what they did starts to make a lot of sense for why. But then also is to start watching over them. You know, in first Timothy. In chapter 5, and verse 4, and he's actually teaching the church about widows and taking care of the widows. And he says this, But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some, some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. In other words, what he's saying here to these people, he said, Look, if you have, your parents are part of the widows within the church. You know what the first level of responsibility is? It's on you. It's, it's your family. You know, this, this life is a, somewhat of a cycle that we go through. We start out being taken care of by our parents, and then we become the parents, and we take care of our children, and in the end, we start to help our parents with things as they get older. And that's what he's, that's what he's telling me. 
He's saying, look, one of the ways that you honor your parents is by being there for them as they get older. Helping them with the things that they need help with. And with what he's dealing with at this point, there's, there's even the financial things, taking them in or helping them out in financial ways to help provide and take care of them if, if they need it. You know, it's exactly what uh, he would go on to say just four verses later, that if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. This is actually one of those areas where God is, this honor your parents is not just for when you're a little kid. When you're an adult and they're aging, the way that you respond to your parents directly is an outcome of your relationship with God. God says if you're if your relationships aren't in order in this way, if you're not handling your responsibility toward your parents, then he says you're not living out your faith. And so we have a responsibility. You know who is terrible at that responsibility? The religious leaders of Jesus' day, unfortunately. The religious leaders of Jesus' day made a loophole in the law. Jesus corrected them on it. In Mark chapter 7, he says, and he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition." that you've handed down, and many such things you do. You see, what the religious leaders have done is, is as their parents got aged, as they got to the point where they might need some help back from their children, the religious leaders kind of made a loophole. They said, you know, uh, they came up with this idea of Corbin. Corbin is a, a gift. And it, he says, they would declare themselves or their possessions Corbin, that is, given to God, and so then they didn't have to use it to take care of their family. And so the, the, the point is, here's how it works. They declare all their belongings to Corbin, and everybody says, wow, you are really dedicated to God, that you would give everything in your service for God. But the kicker was, they didn't actually give it up. They still were in control of it. They still were in control of their properties, their finances, everything. They still were in control of it, but they just declared it as God's. And so now, they, when it came time to take care of their parents, they would tell their parents, man, I'm sorry, Mom or Dad, I would love to help you. But, you know, you have this great son that gave everything that he has to God, so I've got nothing left. They were actually using it as a loophole to be selfish with their possessions and not help provide for their parents and come out looking really good in doing so. And Jesus came down hard on him. He said, you are hypocrites. He said, when I, Isaiah said, this is a hard-hearted people that block their ears and don't listen to me, he was talking about you. And so he, he said, this is ridiculous. And so we are supposed to honor our parents. Now, how does that happen? And as a child, it's through obedience. And as an adult, it's through helps. What kind of ways can we help? You know, last weekend, uh, we were doing a project around our house, and our kids were home, some of them, and and uh, uh, Daniel was one of the ones that was home, and he helped me do some wiring on the house. In fact, he, he did the wiring part of the project on, on our house for me. And later on, Liz said to Lisa something about uh, Dan really enjoying the opportunity to get a help out of Dad. Now, I'm a long ways from crippled up. I feel a little slower moving, I'll give you that. But, but I'm a long ways from crippled up, but I, there's something in him that just wants to help Dad. And I'm thankful for that. That's the way we should be. That's how we give honor to our parents. Well, the last way is, the, or the last word, I should say, is that comes to my mind is the word asset. When, it, when you're dealing with honoring your parents, there's uh, attitude that's involved. There's action that's involved. But the last word that I think about is the word asset. You know, asset is all the plus column of your life. Asset is all the things that are in your to your advantage. They're the, they're the things that you have that are valuable, that are, that are possessions that way. Well, you know, fatherhood is a huge asset in our life. In fact, when I look at the passage here, notice the reason that God says 
He says, honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Stop and think about that. Let that settle in. It was after it settled in for a while that I understood exactly what he's saying. He's not talking individually right here. He's talking corporately about Israel as a nation. And God is taking them. Remember, he took them from Egypt. They're in the wilderness right now. He's taking them to the promised land. And he says, when you get there, you better honor your parents if you want to live long in the land that God is giving you. It's not your parents giving it to you. It's God that's giving it to you. But if you want to continue to enjoy that, you better honor your parents. And you know why I think that is? I think it's because when we get to the point where we dishonor our parents, you see, the family is the cornerstone of society. It's the, it's the capstone of the foundation for the community at large. And when the family starts to break down, the community starts to break down. And just as I mentioned earlier, I think that a lot of the unrest that we have within our communities at large, within this nation, is because of the breakdown of the family. If we weren't absent from fathers, we wouldn't have nearly the chaos that we have in the United States today. And that's exactly what God is telling Israel. He's saying, I'm giving you, not just you individuals, you Israelites, this land to go live in. If you want it to be a long-term deal, you better honor your fathers and mothers. Because that's what holds the community together, is that those family relationships. Well, in Deuteronomy, as we mentioned, in Deuteronomy, he adds one phrase to it. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. In other words, he's saying, look, so that your days are long, their days in the land, so that it goes well with you. In other words, remember the, what I told you earlier about when I decided to go my own way and the catastrophe that it led to in my life? He's saying, honor your father and mother and you won't have that. It works. If you honor your father and mother, if I would have honored my father and mother at that time in my life, my life would have been better. I wouldn't have been living in that dungeon of a laundry room. And I wouldn't have been fired from my job. And I wouldn't have been kicked out of school. Uh, my life would have been better because of honoring my father and mother. It works. You know, this is last week. We had a storm. And, and when, I had, when we had a storm, uh, I got out and cleaned the gutters at my house and at the church and stuff. And Lisa always laughs at me because I always clean the, clean the gutters of the storm. I think there's two reasons for that. One is, that's when you know that they're plugged. Right? When they start flowing over everything, that's when they're plugged. That's also when it's more urgent because maybe it's going to get something wet that you don't want wet. So you want to get it taken care of. In the sunshine, who cares if the gutters are plugged? It doesn't matter. But in the rain, it matters. And so that's one reason that I clean them in the, in the rain. You've got to avoid lightning and stuff. Don't do this. It's probably not a good idea. But, <laughs> but the other thing is, you don't have to move the lever as much. Right? You just go to where the down spot is, and you pull the stuff off, it's plugging it, and the, and the full gutters kind of bring everything to you. And so you don't have this time saver. You don't have to move the, the ladder as much, and you can see that everything's working. It works. It's going down the down spot. You know, the other day I, I thought I climbed way up on the upper gutter to, to clean that one out. And uh, I noticed there was hardly anything in the gutter. It was all in the down spot. You know, if I had done that on a dry day, I would have thought everything was just fine. I would have just put the ladder away and went back. But I knew since the gutter was full of water and pouring over, that there's a problem somewhere. So I found it in the down spot. I got to take care of it. You see, it works. You know what? That's exactly what God is saying about this. You honor your parents. It works. It works in your life. But we don't, it's not about more social programs. Unless you're going to use the social programs to bolster the family, to get the family back where it should be. You know, God didn't, didn't ordain the social program. God ordained the family. And if you want to change your communities, change the families. The only problem is all the wrong people know that secret. There's so much being done in our society to undermine the family. 
You know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I just recently read an article by a Harvard professor that is considered to be kind of an expert on family matters and community things, and, and she wants to do away with homeschool. And, uh, and just one more shot at the family. You know, you want to, I didn't homeschool, we homeschooled our kids a little bit here and there, but predominantly they were either in private Christian schools or in our public school here in Newport. And I'm thankful for our public school here. But you know what? The responsibility of raising your kids was not given to the public school or some fancy professor from Harvard or anybody else. The responsibility for raising your children is yours. And as a fix to our communities and the struggles that we see within them right now, taking down more authority from parents in the lives of their family is not the answer that's going to rule the day or not, not going to fix the problem. You see, if we just get back to family, that's the institution God put back together. If we can keep the fathers in the home, if we can have the two people getting married and the two become one and then they have children and they raise them up for their entire lives and their children are then there to take care of them when they're at the end of their days, doesn't that just make sense? There's the common sense that we saw when we talked about the earth. As we remember our fathers. And you know what? That's exactly why in 2 Timothy, God gives us a warning. He says, but understand this. That in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. I see a little reflection of that back at one point in my life. All of those things. There's going to be times of trouble when people become disobedient to their parents and cast off that impact in the family. And we're seeing it right within our own society. You know, within our society, children in fatherless homes are four times more likely to grow up in poverty. There are two times greater risk of infant mortality. I thought that was an interesting, that was one I never thought of. And this isn't talking about abortion or miscarriages. It's actually talking about, the article that I read was talking about the first 28 days of their life. You realize there's not a father in the home? A child surviving the first 28 days of their life are twice as likely to survive it if they've got an intact family. I don't know how all that plays out, but I found it interesting. Also, 7 out of 10 high school dropouts are fatherless. Girls twice as likely suffer from obesity, and they're seven times more likely to end up pregnant than if they've got a father in the home. Dramatically greater risk of drug and alcohol abuse. I tried finding a number on this, but uh, all I could find was people saying it was dramatically, but the, it's hugely different, but not necessarily a percentage going with it. Also, twice as likely to commit suicide. They're more likely to have behavioral problems, face abuse, neglect, commit a crime, and go to prison. All of those things. And it was astounding to look. One of the things I did was look at the statistics for. Um, what groups of people were struggling with fatherlessness? And, 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 it, and then what groups of people were struggling with crime and imprisonment and drug and alcohol and suicide and all those things, and they followed exactly. If you have a high or a low rate of fatherlessness, you have a low rate of everything else. If you have a high rate of fatherlessness, you have a high rate of everything else. Our families are necessary. Thank God for our fathers that are faithful, that are standing in, that are committed. They are a huge asset in our life. Our Father, we're thankful for this day and we're thankful for the fathers that you give us. And we're thankful for the whole family structure. And Lord, we're thankful to be a part of it. God, I think of everything that you provided me, for me, through my family over the years. I'm very grateful. And then I'm also grateful to be one that's providing, being used to provide those things for my family as well. God, we just pray that you know our fathers to feel honored to. And that 
more than that. So we can see an impact on fathers in our nation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's take our hymn.